Chapter Seventeen of the Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stenzel, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Seventeen: The First Deputy. Oh, how this spring of love resembleth the uncertain glory of an April day, which now shows all the beauty of the sun, and by and by a cloud takes all away. Two Gentlemen of Verona One evening, when the sun was setting, and he was sitting near his love at the bottom of the orchard, far from all intruders, he meditated deeply. Will such sweet moments, he said to himself, last forever? His soul was engrossed in the difficulty of deciding on a calling. He lamented that great attack of unhappiness which comes at the end of childhood and spoils the first years of youth in those who are not rich. Ah, he exclaimed, was not Napoleon the heaven-sent savior for young Frenchmen? Who is to replace him? What will those unfortunate youths do without him, who, even though they are richer than I am, have only just the few crowns necessary to procure an education for themselves, but have not at the age of twenty enough money to buy a man and advance themselves in their career? Whatever one does, he added with a deep sigh, that's fatal memory will always prevent our being happy. He suddenly saw Madame de Renal frown. She assumed a cold and disdainful air. She thought his way of looking at things typical of a servant. Brought up as she was with the idea that she was very rich, she took it for granted that Julian was also so. She loved him a thousand times more than life and set no store by money. Julian was far from guessing these ideas, but that frown brought him back to earth. He had sufficient presence of mind to manipulate his phrases and to give the noble lady who was sitting so near him on the grass seat to understand that the words he had just repeated had been heard by him during his journey to his friend the wood merchant. It was the logic of infidels. "'Well, have nothing to do with those people,' said Madame de Renal, still keeping a little bit of that icy air which had suddenly succeeded an expression of the warmest tenderness." This frown, or rather his remorse for his own imprudence, was the first check to the illusion which was transporting Julian. He said to himself, She is good and sweet, she has a great fancy for me, but she has been brought up in the enemy's camp. They must be particularly afraid of that class of men of spirit who, after a good education, have not enough money to take up a career. What would become of those nobles if we had an opportunity of fighting them with equal arms? Suppose me, for example, Mayor Verrier, and as well-meaning and honest as Monsieur de Renal is at bottom. What short shrift I should make of the vicaire Monsieur Valenod and all their jobberies! How justice would triumph in Verrier! It is not their talents which would stop me. They are always fumbling about that day julian's happiness almost became permanent our hero lacked the power of daring to be sincere he ought to have had the courage to have given battle and on the spot madame de renal had been astonished by julian's phrase because the men in her circle kept on repeating that the return of robespierre was essentially possible by reason of those overeducated young persons of the lower classes Madame de Renal's coldness lasted a longish time and struck Julian as marked. The reason was that the fear that she had said something in some way or other disagreeable to him succeeded her annoyance for his own breach of taste. This unhappiness was vividly reflected in those features which looked so pure and so naive when she was happy and away from intruders. Julian no longer dared to surrender himself to his dreams. Growing calmer and less infatuated, he considered that it was imprudent to go and see Madame de Renal in her room. It was better for her to come to him. If a servant noticed her going about the house, a dozen different excuses could explain that. But this arrangement had also its inconveniences. Julian had received from Foucault some books, which he, as a theology student, would never have dared to ask for in a bookshop. He only dared to open them at night. He would often have found it much more convenient not to be interrupted by a visit, the very waiting for which had even on the evening before the little scene in the orchard completely destroyed his mood for reading. 
he had madame de renal to thank for understanding books in quite a new way he had dared to question her on a number of little things the ignorance of which cuts quite short the intellectual progress of any young man born out of society however much natural genius one may choose to ascribe to him this education given through sheer love by a woman who was extremely ignorant was a piece of luck julian managed to get a clear insight into society such as it is to-day his mind was not bewildered by the narration of what it had been once two thousand years ago or even sixty years ago in the time of voltaire or louis the fifteenth the scales fell from his eyes to his inexpressible joy and he understood at last what was going on in verrieres in the first place there were the very complicated intrigues which had been woven for the last two years around the prefect of Besancon. They were backed up by letters from Paris, written by the cream of the aristocracy. The scheme was to make Monsieur de Morod, he was the most devout man in the district, the first and not the second deputy of the mayor of Verrieres. He had for a competitor a very rich manufacturer whom it was essential to push back into place of second deputy. Julian understood at last the innuendos which he had surprised when the high society of the locality used to come and dine at monsieur de renal's this privileged society was deeply concerned with the choice of a first deputy while the rest of the town and above all the liberals did not even suspect its possibility the factor which made the matter important was that as everybody knows the east side of the main street of verrieres has to be put more than nine feet back since the street has become a royal route now if monsieur de Morod, who had three hours liable to have their frontage put back succeeded in becoming first deputy and consequently mayor in the event of monsieur de renal being elected to the chamber he would shut his eyes and it would be possible to make little imperceptible re repairs in the houses projecting on to the public road as a result of which they would last a hundred years in spite of the great piety and proved integrity of monsieur de Morod, every one was certain that he would prove amenable because he had a great many children among the houses liable to have their frontage put back nine belonged to the cream of various society in julian's eyes this intrigue was much more important than the history of the battle of fontenoy whose name he now came across for the first time in one of the books which Foucault had sent him. There had been many things which had astonished Julian since the time five years ago when he had started going to the curés in the evening. But discretion and humility of spirit being the primary qualities of a theological student, it had always been impossible for him to put questions. One day Madame de Renal was giving an order to her husband's valet, who was Julian's enemy. "'But, madame, today is the last Friday in the month,' the man answered in a rather strange manner. "'Go,' said madame de Renal. "'Well,' said Julian, "'I suppose he's going to go to that corn shop which was once a church "'and has recently been restored to religion. "'But what is he going to do there? "'That's one of the mysteries which I have never been able to fathom. "'It's a very literary institution, but a very curious one,' answered madame de Renal. "'Women are not admitted to it. All I know is that everybody uses the second person singular. The servant, for instance, will go and meet Monsieur Valenot there, and the haughty prig will not be a bit offended at hearing himself addressed by St. Jean in that familiar way, and will answer him in the same way. If you are keen on knowing what takes place, I will ask Monsieur de Morin and Monsieur Valenot for details. We pay twenty francs for each servant to prevent their cutting our throats one fine day time flew the memory of his mistress's charms distracted julian from his black ambition the necessity of refraining from mentioning gloomy or intellectual topics since they both belonged to opposing parties added without his suspecting it to the happiness which he owed her and to the dominion which she acquired over him on the occasions when the presence of the precocious children reduced them to speaking the language of cold reason julian looked at her with eyes sparkling with love would listen with complete docility to her explanations of the world as it is frequently in the middle of an account of some cunning piece of jobbery with reference to a road or a contract madame de renal's mind would suddenly wander to the very point of delirium julian found it necessary to scold her she indulged when with him 
in the same intimate gestures which she used with her own children. The fact was that there were days when she deceived herself that she loved him like her own child. Had she not repeatedly to answer his naive questions about a thousand simple things that a well-born child of fifteen knows quite well? An instant afterwards, she would admire him like her master. His genius would even go so far as to frighten her. She thought she should see more clearly every day the future great man in this young abbe. She saw him pope. She saw him first minister like Richelieu. Shall I live long enough to see you in your glory? She said to Julian. There is room for a great man. Church and state have need of one. End of chapter 17